Vancouver. And thanks to the Centre for Organizing Us today, it's uh, we look forward to a very interesting discussion. Um, as uh, the stage has already been set, um, I will not really delve too much into the strategic relationship between India and China. I will straight away move on to the nuclear facet of India's relationship with China in the nuclear realm. Uh, there are two primary pillars which define the nuclear relationship between India and China. And the first would be India's own nuclear relationship with China, and the second would be uh, the Chinese and Pakistani WND collaboration that has impacted upon strategic stability in South Asia and that directly impacts upon India's uh, ensuing policy and posture as well. So I'll come to the Chinese relationship uh, with Pakistan in the realm of nuclear and missile transfers later on. I'd like to begin by firstly giving out just a very um, quick overview of India's nuclear policy and posturing that has been in the subcontinent. Um, as most of you are aware, for us, uh, nuclear weapons uh, always were and continue to be uh, an instrument of uh, not military usage. They are a political instrument and we do not consider them as an instrument of war fighting. The sole purpose for India's nuclear weapons would be to deter the use and the threat of use of nuclear weapons against itself. However, um, there are certain factors which have impacted greatly upon uh, the existing strategic stability in South Asia. Uh, the introduction of battlefield nuclear weapons by Pakistan has lowered the nuclear threshold, and I shall get into that uh, maybe later on. Um, all these factors have greatly and very severely uh, complicated the existential stability and posturing of, uh, especially in the nuclear realm in the region. As far as we are concerned, be it our nuclear weapons in terms of their scope, in terms of the operational readiness, uh, the warheads, the delivery systems, and the key subcomponents, um, India's nuclear weapons are not deployed in any way. And this is very visible that in terms of our force structures, the alert levels, the systems are not mated, they are demated systems absolutely. And the very fact that we as a nation have unequivocally renounced first use, uh, we follow a retaliation policy only. <clears throat> India has declared a no first use against nuclear weapon states unequivocally and also a declared non-use against non-nuclear weapon states. So this inherently then rules out the entire conceptual discourse towards nuclear preemption. So that, that debate doesn't really go on to the next level per se. Uh, however, um, when we finally gave out a statement on the nuclear weapons in 2003 by our official cabinet committee on security, we added a very significant word to that statement and I'll quote that quote. Um, nuclear weapons, it said, will only be used in retaliation against a nuclear attack on Indian territory or on Indian forces. Now, this was the original statement which was there in uh, the earlier draft doctrine. However, this time around, we've added the word anywhere. So, in the eventual possibility of new <coughs> Indian forces being attacked with a battlefield nuclear weapon, even if they are not within Indian territory, will be considered a nuclear attack, a first nuclear attack on India. And this I found was a very profound word to be added. As opposed to that, we see the Chinese nuclear weapons program, which in many ways is similar in terms of their approach. They also had a no first use um, uh, declared uh, stance. Uh, however, there are certain facets vis-a-vis -vis nuclear modernization in China's weapon systems, which uh, does cause a lot of concern. Uh, the current uh, deployment of Chinese missiles in the Tibetan Autonomous Region is very concerning. Some of these missile systems, like the Tongfang-21 systems, have been shifted from the eastern coast of China, which were earlier facing Taiwan, and have been replaced by other systems, and now the Tongfang-21, some of them have been moved over to the Tibetan Autonomous Region, and this has been very well documented as well. There, are, uh, there is a very interesting Chinese concept of Jan Lu Shui, which emphasizes on very two very distinct facets of uh, ordering the use of nuclear weapons. One would be that the supreme national leadership would order the use. 
under the supreme command so when they speak about the supreme national leadership and the supreme command we definitely have have are referring um in an almost a uh, centric manner to the central military commission and the chairman of the central military commission so currently that would be xi jinping interestingly shan again the same document which is an official document uh jan le chui also defines a nuclear second strike with chinese called tongshan in uh, carrying out the direction carrying out the attack under the directions of the supreme command and it very significantly states that the authority to launch a retaliatory strike could be delegated to the lower levels under certain unspecified circumstances so where this is where the entire chinese strategic ambiguity comes into play where these conditions are not very clearly um uh, enunciated and from an indian standpoint this becomes a, an issue of great concern to us primarily because um the chinese uh, do not consider the use of nuclear weapons on their own territory as a violation of their not no first use now this becomes very complicated from an indian standpoint because as uh, my colleague earlier mentioned uh, the entire state of arunachal pradesh which is an integral part of india is being claimed by china and they have often now resorted to terming it as southern tibet so the question that we often are confronted with and we are debating is would arunachal pradesh as a scenario as a stand alone scenario how would this logic then fit into arunachal and um, it is also very clear that what the chinese often talk about uh, establishing minimum deterrence the capability currently which china has be it the tongfang 31 systems the tongfang 31a the tongfang 41 the slbms the julian systems all of them very clearly depict that the, the the capabilities that china has in the realm of the nuclear uh, field are far beyond uh pure minimum deterrence so you you see the capabilities notching up and even the the latest uh white paper on military strategy very clearly speaks about strengthening strategic deterrence and there is a very strong emphasis on that term so um we see especially in the case of tibet we see advanced tongfang 21 systems which the chinese often refer to as the css5 systems they are uh, medium range ballistic missiles they are a basic variant of the tongfang 21 um we would have uh, estimates that these tongfang 21 systems could well deliver a 500 kt warhead over 8, 1800 km so pretty much a major share of indian territory does come into the target of these missiles which are just right next door to us on what we often refer to as the Indo-Tibetan border um and all these missile systems are gps uh, guidance systems so this uh, then facilitates uh, for precision strike missions and the chinese pla air force also has been uh, involved in some exercises on that there are immense number of missile launch brigades already in tibet which are currently operational they are at the saidam basin the gulan basin there are missile launch sites at terlinka in tibet uh, there is a new launch site being crea- created at the amdo base at nakchuka and there are underground bases at lhasa and kongpo i came across a very interesting study by the um, american based natural resources defense council that golmud in lhasa a uh, potentially is a bomber dispersal base and this was also corroborated with certain other territories <clears throat> in the realm of uh, the maritime neighborhood that we have in the indian ocean region china's nuclear power projection slowly is a new facet that is being introduced and uh, there are grave concerns on regional stability based on that nuclear power projection by china in the indian ocean region is signaling a very strong strategic intent in fact um, in december 2013 and february 2014 during that time uh, a chinese shang class nuclear power attack submarine conducted a two month deployment in the indian ocean and uh, this was um, also uh, followed up in the same year with a shang class diesel powered attack submarine which again was pretty much in the indian ocean region uh when the chinese defense ministry was officially questioned on this move they said that these systems these uh, uh vessels were primarily there to support the counter piracy missions but at the same time what cannot be ignored 
that while they were conducting these piracy missions and supporting these missions that the Chinese are involved in, um, area familiarization were being also taken up by these submarines. So that cannot be dis uh, uh, totally dis discarded. So my my point would be that all these endeavors have have largely sort of been uh, demonstrators of China's growing uh, naval power. Uh, the PLA Navy has come far far from what it was initially uh, many many decades back when China launched its uh, military modernization program and uh, when the PLA per se was a very rustic and a bucolic army which launched a, a people's war. Uh, today the Chinese forces are far beyond that. They are as he mentioned earlier they are far more uh, capable and willing to assert their presence and when you see multiple areas where the Chinese forces have been launching their um, um, assertive and aggressive postures, be it in the East China Sea with Japan over the Sankaku, be it developing islands uh, uh, in the potentially the largest reclamation projects in the South China Sea, uh, be it with uh, raising, notching up tensions with India over, over areas in Western Ladakh. It seems that China seems to be capable of launching multiple areas of tensions at the same time. And I'm talking about April 2012 and beyond. That was the time when all this actually started building up very um, quickly. And uh, these kind of Chinese power projection capabilities, uh, the reticence to accept India as a nuclear weapons power, uh, Brigadier Kamal talked about how China does not recognize India as a nuclear weapons power and therefore restricts or totally rejects the idea of sitting across the table with India and discussing nuclear confidence building measures and nuclear risk reduction measures. So these in fact are uh, certain, these areas of opacity as it were, are affecting this overall strategic relationship between India and China. Given the very heavy militarized borders, given the massive infrastructure development projects that have been launched by China in Tibet, the, uh, the presence of missile systems, I think it is very pressing that China uh, sits across the table with India and discusses nuclear confidence building and risk reduction measures in order to ensure the larger stability in the um, Asian uh, neighborhood. I was at Sandia in uh, 2012 uh, at the Sandia National Laboratory where I, I did a project on the potential need for India and China to uh, have a mechanism to discuss nuclear confidence building and in that project I had proposed a few uh, potential areas where which could be discussed between the two countries and some of the very critical recommendations that uh, I had proposed were um, that um, we negotiating an unconditional no first use against each other should not be a very difficult thing to do because primarily both countries have a no first use per se. But again, there are those very thin lines which, which need to be uh, discussed and that can only happen in a dialogue mechanism that cannot happen otherwise. Uh, similarly, India and China could also agree on the unconditional non-use and non-threat of use against non-nuclear weapon states, including in nuclear free zones. There could be a declaration of not using WMD against each other. There could be a mutual detargeting agreement. There could be an agreement on technical parameters, pre-notification of flight testing of the ballistic missiles, especially in the border regions. Um, there could be a mutual agreement on redu uh, reducing risk of accidental and unauthorized use of nuclear weapons. So basically the point I'm trying to drive here is that there is ample scope to discuss all these mechanisms uh, if, if there is an actual will and this will greatly reduce the existential tensions in very sensitive areas as, as the nuclear realm and it will add to growing confidence between India and China who are trying to build a relationship uh, Prime Minister Modi has invested a lot of energy into his relationship, into in his relationship with China, and Xi Jinping has been reciprocating. But however, if there if there are going to be continuing areas which are absolutely non-approachable, that will hurt the overall bilateral relationship between the two countries. Um, I think I'll stop here. In case there are any further questions or comments, we can take it on during Q and A. So, uh, thank you for giving me a very patient here. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank both of you for those uh, really fascinating and uh, comprehensive overviews of the strategic situation in India vis-a-vis -vis China.
So we're going to open it up for questions, and so I'd ask uh, to, when you ask a question, I'll acknowledge you, just uh, state your name and just give a quick overview of uh, what your affiliation is, especially for our interns here, and then uh, ask the questions away. We should be uh, trying to give us about 30 minutes of question and answer. Okay, so, who else wants to start? No one wants to start, I'll start. Okay, Lane will start and then I'll follow up. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm Ileana Sorkin, my deputy director here at CNS. Um, thank you both. It's really fantastic uh, overview that you provided. Um, my question to you would be is that one that quite often we uh, hear about the um, South Asia or in, in Asia uh, in general, we don't really quite often um, speak about just the bilateral relationships. There are like one party leads to another and the third party so you have a circle or sometimes triangle whatever square and then goes on and on um, something that would when I was um, hearing, hearing both of your presentations and um, um, the way the there's certainly a need for confidence in the measure and, and the dialogue but how do you what would be the incentives for doing it. Uh, a related question is that when I uh, discuss similar issues come up with the discussions with Pakistan uh, representatives, and they, they uh, to a certain degree, repeat the same arguments when they discuss their relationship with India. So how would you uh, maybe put a little bit more uh, into perspective, not just the EU, India, China, but the entire Pakistan, India, China, US, and, and yeah. so on. Uh, I think that's, that's um, you've just summed it up so brilliantly, because that, in fact, is the security dilemma of South Asia. Um, no relationship is bilateral strictly in the sense of a bilateral relationship as we understand that in international theory. They all have the factors which impact upon or impinge upon the bilateral relationship. The relationship between India and Pakistan, uh, the moment you add the word strategic, you cannot but think about uh, the assistance which has been provided by China uh, illicitly to Pakistan ever since the decade of the 80s be it a nuclear weapons design, be it unsafeguarded reactors, be it um, complete missile systems, be it ring magnets. And it is extremely difficult and complicated from an Indian perspective to ignore this and try and have an equation with Pakistan today. Because these are certain determinants which have, uh, I would be very careful in using the word, but they, this. This factor has spoiled the existential uh, security scenario uh, to an extent that it cannot be repaired now. We just now need to go forward from where we are. And it's extremely um, complex for us not to take that into account. Again, in the case of China, um, if we have, if you're talking of the bilateral relationship between India and China, you see uh, areas such as Pakistan occupied Kashmir, Brigadier Kamal spoke about it. Now, in a disputed area, which India claims as entire part of Jammu and Kashmir, which is a part of in India, you see permanent Chinese presence of the PLA Construction Corps troops in Pakistan occupied Kashmir. They are involved in construction of highways, bridges, power plants, and uh, uh, helping out in building infrastructure which can be of dual use so while it is providing in civilian uh, uh, infrastructure uh, for the you know for civilian purposes but in turn in, in, in a case of a conflict all this infrastructure can double up as military support not just to Pakistani forces but to China's PLA as well now so therefore we have often discussed this and one of our former army chiefs General Deepak Kapoor spoke about a two-front situation for Indian armed forces where we have already a very live Western front with Pakistan uh, we Relatively, we have a peaceful front with China. There are, there is no firing, there is no armed conflict, but the tensions always are there. So, 
Resultantly, what do we have? We have an India which has a very heavily militarized Western border with Pakistan and an equally heavily militarized border with China. And we have an India where you see Pakistan and China in collaboration and collusion with each other in the realm of military hardware transfers, in the realm of WMD collaboration, which puts us in a very difficult spot. So it is, we would like to have bilateral talks without any third party reflections on it. However, our setting is such that it's extremely difficult to uh, take it on that way. But, but um, my question has been a little bit full off in terms of the bilateral discussion with Pakistan. Uh, how, uh, or is there a room for a trilateral discussion? And also, what are the incentives for, or, or conditions, what do you see, what would be for the uh, Indian-China dialogue? Yeah, I understand what you're trying to say. I, I, kind of like maybe you could. I, I agree with the essence of your comment. Yeah. We may live in an interesting time, but we live in a dangerous neighborhood, a dangerous nuclear neighborhood. Second da most dangerous neighborhood in the world, closely vying with West Asia for the number one spot. And uh, it is because of the, the factors that you mentioned. The ideal would be to resolve the root causes of the tension. And those are the two territorial disputes. The one with Pakistan over Jammu and Kashmir and the one with China over part of Jammu and Kashmir that is Aksai Chen and Ladakh and the claim over Arunachal Pradesh. My friend Brigadier Feroz would readily agree with me that the only possible solution, possible solution is to accept the line of control as an open international border. But there isn't a national consensus in either country, Pakistan or India at present. So the two governments need to build a national consensus first and then negotiate with each other. As for bilateral versus trilateral or multilateral uh, negotiations with, between India and Pakistan, India's clearly stated uh, uh, position is that we prefer bilateral talks. We have a Shimla agreement of 1972 under which we agreed to talk to each other bilaterally over the dispute and that's the way it should be. Bringing in third parties tends to complicate the atmosphere and confuse its, its confusion worse confounded rather than help resolve. As far as China is concerned, once again with China, if we could resolve the territorial dispute, and once again there itself, although there is a there are two unanimous resolutions of Indian Parliament so far since 1947, since we got our independence. The first one says that every inch of territory in Jammu and Kashmir must be taken back from Pakistan. The second one says that every inch of territory must be taken back from the Chinese. So, any government that attempts to deviate from these will have some trouble on its hands. It's a, we are a very noisy democracy, so it, it won't be easy. But with China also, there is no other solution than finders keepers. What they have, they keep in Aksai Chin and Ladakh and uh, what they are staking a claim to, they give up. But the Chinese position is, what we have, we already have. Yeah. What else are you willing to give up? Give us. <laughs> so we want we want Southern Tibet, all of Southern Tibet. Okay, we will settle for the Tawang track. Now, if we give them Tawang, then they are virtually in the plains. Virtually in the plains. And in military terms, you can understand that's an extremely problematic situation for us. Why do they want Tawang? They claim that uh, the sixth Dalai Lama was born in Tawang. We are touched by the touching concern the Chinese have for a dead Dalai Lama. For a dead Dalai Lama. When they don't care two hoots for a living Dalai Lama. We are touched, extremely touched. But I think the solution lies in accepting the situation as it is. There is wisdom in that for both the countries. Whether we will move forward in that direction, how long will it take, it is not really easy to predict at all. Thank you. Uh, next question. <coughs> Tim? If I may. Um, hi, I'm Tim Frazier, uh, one of the undergraduate interns from Middlebury College. And I wanted to ask if um, two of you might comment on some of your earlier comments about North Korea's role in as an indirect influence in nuclear um, proliferation, such as with Pakistan, and how that affects um, this trilateral 
relationship between um, India, Pakistan, and China. Monica? Just a couple of sentences. North Korea has, under Chinese blessings, transferred Nodong and Tepodong missiles to Pakistan. Created, a ship carrying created missiles was caught on the high sea and intercepted. Not only caught and photographed or something, intercepted. So there is no doubt about the transfer. Right? But uh, as far as the larger issue is concerned, it's power for the poor. Chinese nuclear missile and military hardware collusion with Pakistan is well known to us. It's well known to the world. It's been documented so meticulously by think tanks the world over, as also by the Pentagon in their annual reports and so on. You know, um, during the decade of the 90s, uh, early 90s and even earlier than that, uh, the North Koreans at that time were desperately looking towards uh, getting expert advice on their nuclear program. And because of the international isolation, which was so massive at that point of time, they were not really getting any assistance. And that, and that was the time which was uh, when A.Q. Khan, the Pakistani scientist, was on full swing running this illicit nuclear network of his, right? And uh, at that time, the Pakistanis were looking for uh, some specific range missile systems, which apparently the North Koreans had, and namely the Nodong systems and later on the type of long one systems. So, for the first time in the world, we witnessed what was a very interesting nuclear barter. So, in this nuclear barter, A.Q. Khan, through the illicit network, provided technological assistance to North Korean nuclear program, and the North Koreans, in return, provided uh, missile systems to Pakistan. And that, again, then, had not just had an impact on the immediate equation between India and Pakistan, it had an impact on the overall region because with North Korea getting these systems, the entire Northeast Asian security went for a toss. You had nations like Japan and you had South Korea, they all had their concerns. The United States has existed, the United States extended deterrence in the region came up, came for, was challenged. And the entire security and strategic situation got very, very perplexed. So that was to answer your question that it was a very unique and interesting nuclear barter, as we, had, we called it when we were uh, studying this issue. Not seen in history earlier. It's, it's an interesting cross-regional voluntary. Yes, yes. Thank you. Sir. Oh, Rod, do you have a question? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sharad Joshi, and uh, I'm an assistant professor in the uh, nonproliferation and terrorism studies program. Uh, no, but in uh, one of your presentations, you talked about uh, the concept of strategic autonomy, and uh, as well as subsequently about uh, uh, ties between India and the US and how that affects their uh, uh, thinking on, uh, on, you know, on China in the region as well as uh, as well as globally, and you know, uh, and you referred to uh, the. Uh, the idea that uh, closer ties between India and the U.S. would, uh, you know, would somehow lead to uh, you know, uh, uh, a balance against uh, uh, against China. Now, I'm just wondering if there's a contradiction or a slight contradiction between uh, you know, strategic autonomy as a guiding principle of Indian foreign policy, you know, which is not Indian, um, and uh, assuming that uh, that there would be some sort of uh, uh, mutually beneficial balance with respect to China, you know? because uh, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if, from the Indian perspective, also there's this need to view uh, ties with uh, China uh, independent rather than as a function of uh, like, uh, of uh, uh, the increasingly close partnership between India and the US. You know? So, um, so I'm just wondering if. Uh, you know, if this idea of a strategic balance, because that's a pretty strong step, you know, uh, you know, if that is slightly overblown, and if within the Indian foreign policy establishment, uh, you know, there is a lot more nuanced thinking on uh, how to approach uh, China. That's a very good question, and quite obviously there is an there is a contradiction in uh, what I said and what might uh, be the case. Let me state clearly that the government position is that we cherish our strategic autonomy and we like to balance our bilateral relationships and not have one relationship outweigh another. 
that is the government position the rest of the formulation the last couple of slides was mine that was my interpretation of the why i think of the indo us strategic partnership as a hedge against eventualities that may occur in the future in china as long as china doesn't join a cooperative security framework in asia there are two schools of thought ladies and gentlemen in delhi i can name the gentlemen as they have gone public one is known as the shiv shankar menon school of thought and that is that each bilateral relationship is unique and one must not be more important than the other otherwise we will have trouble on our hands that is known as non alignment version 2.0 and some and some gentlemen have got together and written a book called non alignment version 2.0 i shall reserve my comments on that book the second school of thought is the sham saran school of thought and the sham saran school of thought is be non aligned but threaten to be aligned get that threaten to be aligned so that is the second school of thought and that school of thought was reflected in my last few slides about the indo us strategic partnership being a hedging strategy in case there are some eventualities that may occur within china or china behaves irresponsibly militarily somewhere in asia let me end by saying that i go a little beyond the second school of thought my formulation is that we must take the indo us strategic partnership to the next higher order of trajectory so that it is just short of a military alliance because i see trouble on the horizon with china what china is doing is not in india's national interest it is unlikely to change course and therefore sooner or later we will have trouble on our hands we cannot fight two adversaries at the same time two front war therefore we need to take the indo us strategic partnership to the next or next higher trajectory just short of an alliance Okay. Uh, I think Anna is first. Right? No, you go ahead. Uh, oh, well, Anna first. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Hi, I'm Anne Pellegrino. I'm an intern here at CNS, and um, with Pakistan ex expanding its uh, submarine fleet and purchasing new submarines from China in the future, do either of you have any insight into the Indian military's perception of this? And do you think in the future? We could see more conflicts playing out in the Indian Ocean because of assertion of uh, maritime power rather than on the borders. Okay. Pakistan is acquiring six submarines from China, diesel electric, right, Manika? Eight. 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 Okay. A recent announcement. Fair enough. Pakistan is a sovereign state. The Chinese are a sovereign state, and they are welcome to sell to Pakistan whatever they wish to, and for Pakistan to acquire whatever they wish to for their defence. let me say two things one for the next 10 years 10 to 12 years and this is the broad consensus in the strategic community in delhi not personally my formulation for the next 10 to 12 years maybe 10 to 15 years the chinese pla navy may send a submarine lurking in indian ocean for a month or so but is not in a position to operate at operational level certainly not the strategic level coherently in the indian ocean the indian navy enjoys an edge the indian navy has strategic partners like the us navy australian navy singapore navy uk navy and so on they are carrying out joint patrolling of the sea lanes of communication under the garb of naval exercises so they there is some kind of a coalition of the willing loosely structured operating out there right so we do not worry about the pla navy for the next 10 to 12 years maybe 15 years but uh, sales defense sales will take place which is fine now pakistan has been attempting to acquire a triad of nuclear weapons maybe monka will have more to say on that at the moment the naval leg of the triad is limited to surface to surface missiles being mounted on surface ships that's not the best way to go about it so the next best is they don't have nuclear powered submarine i don't think the chinese will give them a nuclear powered submarine Uh, so therefore try to mount a ballistic missile on a diesel electric submarine good luck it hasn't been done before i agree with dilip kaur when he says that the pla navy would not have the capability to challenge the indian navy in the next 10 years directly however what i'd like to add to that would be 
the current acquisition of birthing facilities that China has been involving itself right from be it countries as far as in Asia Pacific moving on to the South Asian region moving on to the Horn of Africa the pattern that the Chinese have been following is very similar um, they have also done this in this Pacific Island group uh, offering loans at very high interest rates very opaque terms and conditions to these very small island nations wherein it almost becomes a given that the country will not be able to pay back on time. And when that happens, which has been the case which, with Seychelles and Maldives and many other countries, as soon as they start defaulting on the payments, that's where the negotiations happen and the Chinese say, all right, we will relax your loan conditions. And what, are, what, is, what, is, what is it that they want in return would be, say, if there are eight birthing facilities for ships and vessels, they want three reserved for China, Chinese vessels. The manifestation of this has become extremely clear, when, be it Chinese ships docking in Sri Lanka. So the birthing area in which the Chinese ships are docking are totally controlled by Chinese uh, agencies and Chinese holding companies. So in, a, in effect, you have a Chinese submarine vessel or a naval vessel coming to Sri Lanka, docking there. Technically, it's a Sri Lankan vessel. It's a Sri Lankan facility, I'm sorry. However, the entire control, everything is Chinese. So it's almost like a Chinese facility. And now you have official Chinese publications openly advocating of 18 such bases starting from the Straits of Malacca right till the Horn of Africa. So be it Kenya, Tanzania, Djibouti, Singapore, uh, sorry, Seychelles, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Gwadar in Pakistan. In fact, Gwadar port, part of it, are, they have already handed it over to the Chinese. So that, that then becomes very, very challenging uh, for um, deterrence uh, in the maritime realm in the Indian Ocean region. Chair, if I may, on a lighter note, the Chinese, there was a news report that they're building a port or a base in the Maldives. Perhaps their engineers did not tell them that in 30 to 40 years' time, the Maldives will go under, so good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We got time for two or three more questions. I saw that. Rose had a question. <laughs> no, 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 I'm always here. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, so going back to what you're saying about how like in the South Asian region no bilateral agreement is really bilateral. Um, if because if India sees the Chinese uh, if India sees the necessity of hedging itself against a closer Chinese Pakistan partnership, <coughs> wouldn't China and Pakistan view the India US Pak uh, India US partnership in the similar light as well? And if so, wouldn't um, actions such as the U.S. sort of strong-arming people or members of the NSG to take India off the export control list to, get, to grant them special, uh, special positions, so to speak, uh, be seen as kind of aggressive behavior from the Chinese perspective as well? And would not, so do you see what I mean? Like it's, a, it's like a vicious cycle between two sides because on your side it's kind of like it's a partnership and then on the Chinese side it's so oh, it's a strategic threat which pushes the two sides even closer and it just goes on. You're absolutely right. China views it with great deal of suspicion and that was one of the bullet points on one of my slides, <laughs> the Indo-US strategic partnership. Yeah. But uh, we, we, we got our NSG waiver. We got our uh, special uh, agreement with the uh, IAEA regarding safeguard and we will shortly be buying uranium. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> other, other questions? Gentlemen, up here next to Shrak. Um, my name is Rohan Thomas John. I'm an Indian citizen. I just graduated from the NPK program over here. Uh, my question is mostly with the uh, point that the Premier put up in his slide and also what you said about it with um, the US and also connected to what he said, the US and the proliferation regime as a whole 
How does that get affected with uh, India getting NSG, uh, getting this privilege of being an NSG now, getting the safeguard agreements done? How does that affect uh, the India-Pakistan relationship? Because now we both were standing out on the NPT on the idea that uh, it isn't going anywhere. But now here we are as India, making the NPT hard for people to join. So just I wanted to, uh, an insight on how you think that okay. that makes us look. The first sentence, the very first sentence in the India-US Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement of 2005, July 2005, mm -hmm. 10 years old this month. Mm -hmm. The first sentence says the United States recognizes India as a responsible nuclear power. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is whatever some proliferation accusations have been made against one or two Indian companies, yeah. that's washed out completely. It's finished. Mm -hmm. Dead and gone. Mm -hmm. As far as Pakistan is concerned, Pakistan has been trying to get similar waivers. Mm -hmm sign a similar deal. As it is uh, with China, without a deal, they have been getting unsafeguarded reactors. Right? So that's another issue. Monica has covered that. Mm -hmm. But we welcome Pakistan's efforts to acquire uh, similar, a similar status and forego any attempts at proliferation subsequently. Pakistan has taken a number of steps. Brigadier Feroz could tell you better. He's written an excellent book which covers some of these things, eating grass. Pakistan has taken a number of steps over the last 10 years mm -hmm. to ensure that there is no further proliferation from Pakistan and that it is also recognized as a responsible partner. India has a uh, responsible nuclear power. India has no objection whatsoever to Pakistan being given such recognition as and when the international community feels that it is appropriate. Thank you. Tim, you wanted to ask one more? If you don't mind, uh, I'm interested in energy development and geopolitics. And so, um, as I understand it, uh, China has been developing hydropower projects along the Brahmaputra at, in its Chinese form, uh, uh, north of the Chinese border, um, somewhat uh, providing another dimension for tensions between um, India and China. I just wanted to ask how um, you feel geopolitics today are related to the two countries' nuclear phosphorus? Well, China has certainly developed, uh, is in the process of developing hydroelectric projects. They claim they are run of the river projects, and therefore there is no storage. And if there is no storage, then there is you know, no stoppage of water and there is no diversion of water. They don't allow Indian inspection. But they have offered to share data more frequently, more regularly than they have done so far. So the jury is still out on this one. Mm -hmm. Some Indian analysts have claimed uh, Brahma Chelani in particular has written a whole book on it. Diversion of river waters by uh, China and not only the Brahmaputra, Sangpo in Tibet as it's called, mm -hmm. but also the Iravati, also which is the other river of beyond the Iravati that flows into Southeast Asia. Mekong, also the Mekong. So uh, the jury is still out on this one. But so far, no diversion has taken place physically. Mind you, taking water out of the Brahmaputra and taking it to mainland China mm. is going to be quite an engineering feat and is going to cost billions and billions of dollars. So, but if there is drought, if the Yellow River dries up and uh, China has no other alternative, they might uh, undertake such a venture. So, India has been asking China to join hands and sign a treaty like the Indus Water Treaty between India and Pakistan. And all the other lower riparian states have also been asking China for a similar treaty, but China has steadfastly refused to do so. For us, may I? Sure. Is anybody else? No, no. Well, there may be once they respond to your question. Okay, I have two questions, you know, quickly. I'll, I'll, uh, we are aware of that China, India, Pakistan, all of three are modernizing and military modernization is very well recorded in all. Monica, one part of the modernization that is ongoing and it will have a lot of effect on the cascading effect on the region is Chinese merving capability, the development of China's merving capability. And there are reports that India and DRDO is following suit with China merving would mean you know what it implies that the accuracy of the targeting policy and on the command centers and also that actually affects stability in many ways and India responds to that. 
Now, given the pattern that India responds to Chinese burning, you know what Pakistan is going to do, whether it makes sense or not, but they're going to do it. And whether it makes sense or not, or whether you like it or not, the Chinese and the Pakistan are going to collaborate on this one. This is just a pattern that comes out from history and your presentation as well. What is your assessment about murdering capacity and then this cascading effect on that? That's my first question. Second question is broader to both of you, most you to figure it out, because your presentation and this presentation has indicated to this audience that China is getting assertive. That's, that's, that's what it comes up. And everything that you're pointing out is that something has gone wrong with the Chinese, that they have suddenly become assertive in 2013, 14, 15 time frame. Uh, what has caused China to become like this? I mean, we don't have a video representative here, but why would China be choosing at this point of time in history to do what you have just mentioned? Uh, what has gone wrong there? A uh, couple of things I may just want to add because you think that India and United States are heading against possible containment or containment. But from Beijing's perspective, when Secretary Leon Canada defends goes to India and makes a statement that India is the linchpin of US rebalancing policy in Asia Pacific, how do you expect Beijing and Islamabad to interpret that? That's my question to you, because the cause of Chinese of assertiveness is important for us to know at this time frame in history. That's the second question. Feroz, you know, I don't really know whether this is a question, because I can just... Second one or first one? No, both your questions, actually, <laughs> because I can just exchange the two uh, combinations that you have said and just present your question back to you and that would be the answer. Okay. So if, if you think that Indo-US relationship or statements by Secretary Panetta, uh, would, um, how would Pakistan and China react to that? So again, I'll just shift how, how do we expect in India to be confronted in a South Asian neighborhood where we have Chinese inroads in every single South Asian country in India's immediate periphery. How do we deal with China's growing almost encirclement on the naval uh, uh, boundaries of India? How do we deal with Chinese massive military modernization, uh, which is directly re reflecting in Chinese presence of highways, infrastructure projects in Tibet, which borders us. How do we ignore the LAC, the growing tensions, the transgressions in, in Ladakh, Western Ladakh, Eastern Ladakh, in Arunachal Pradesh? How do we ignore China claiming thousands of square miles of territory as Chinese territory? So these are very, very pressing uh, realities which, which India is being confronted with. Um, that would be the second part of no, your question. My question is why? That's my question. Why they? I, why I, they I, I can I can answer that as well. <laughs> I think uh, if you very carefully study China's internal discourse ever since Xi Jinping took over hmm. the realms, hmm. there are two ma very major focus areas of Xi Jinping. One is the consultative committee, which has been holding uh, consecutive meetings. They come out with two specific reports. One of these reports is classified. It is for internal consumption of the party and uh, the government. The second is a declassified report, which they have often termed as the peripheral diplomacy uh, uh, <coughs> report. Mm -hmm. In the Chinese assessment of peripheral diplomacy, they are looking for countries which will follow uh, and which will align or which will cooperate with whatever be the word that you would want to use. Uh, with, with Chinese interests, uh, who understand China's sovereignty sensitivities and thereafter will cooperate with China on those lines. However, you have leading Chinese analysts who are working in institutes which are directly under the purview of the State Council and the such as the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and means no words here. They have very clearly stated that the countries who do not adhere to the how the Chinese look at the Asian geopolitics or the Asian geostrategy or the Asian geostrategic alignments 
will be punished and these are the words they are using they will be punished so then it just leaves for us to fill the space which are these countries which are not really adhering to how the chinese vision would be for asia so why they are doing it to a great extent there are two major goals that xi jinping has set for his tenure and maybe the ones who later succeeded one would be to celebrate the bicentennial celebrations one is celebrating 100 years of the party and getting back the control where the where the declaration is very clear that it will always be the party which will command the gun and those inherent tensions that have been debated often between the realms of the PLA and how there could be a potential challenge to the very uh, supreme control of the party that is being aimed to be quashed that's point number one point number two celebrating 100 years of being established as the people's republic of china in order to do that the very core interests continue to remain national reunification the sovereignty issue and if you see in the south china sea the aggressiveness which you uh, said that we have often been referring to everything the official statement of chinese ministry of foreign affairs ministry of defense Everyone says that this is the right of the Chinese given their sovereignty claims. So the entire Chinese conceptual construct of sovereignty then uh, becomes the very foundation on which these developments have been happening. On the question, on your first question, if I have answered your yeah, 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 question, yeah, yeah, yeah. in your, in your morbid, yeah. the first part of the question on the morbing of missile systems, yes, they have been doing it. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, what whatever little I know of China, they are not just doing the morbing of the missiles. They have so also been uh, slow, gradually getting into morbing of the missile systems yeah. as well. That program also has now begun, and and I think I don't. I'm absolutely in agreement with you that will have a direct impact on India. India doing it will have a direct impact on Pakistan, and then everything comes back to what the deputy director initially said that we cannot have a direct bilateral relationship. It'll all be a triangular triangular relationship. So. Thank you. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> okay, firstly, Mervin. Yeah. There is a move in China, as Monica has said, Mervin, Marvin, both. In India, there is no such move for the simple reason that, like Monica explained very clearly at the beginning, our deterrence is the doctrine is credible minimum deterrence. Our posture is no first use, and our strategy is a counter city city busting counter value strategy not a counter force strategy therefore we do not really need moving to execute our strategy the way it has been configured as for the capability four days ago or five days ago just before we left india an indian rocket launched six british satellites into space yes this is not the first time, not the second time, not the third time. N number of times has been repeated with success. If you have the ability to launch satellites, that means you eject satellites at a certain stage of the trajectory, you will agree with me that the second step to then guide satellites or warheads from a missile onto a target is not all that difficult. So the capability exists, but there is no particular move for the very reason that I mentioned, a counter uh, value strategy, not a counter force strategy. Second question, Xi Jinping talked of realizing the Chinese dream when he took over as president. What the words were, Monica will know better, she is a China scholar, I am not. And realizing the Chinese dream includes overcoming a thousand years of humiliation. That's also a Chinese phrase. So that is one reason for the coming out party which is intended. They have, in 1978, launched their program of four modernizations. Three have been completed. The military modernization will be completed somewhere between 2020 and 2025. So they are getting ready for it. So that is why they have discarded Deng Xiaoping's 24 character strategy to hide their capacities and buy their time. Lastly, they sense a security vacuum in Asia. The colonial powers left about 50 to 60 years ago. NATO, ISAF are in the process of packing bags and going home. So they sense a security vacuum in Asia, which they want, they intend to fill up. And that is the reason for their coming up. Thank you, very comprehensive answer. Thank you both. So on that note, I'd like everyone to join me in uh, 
thanking our guests for a very wide-ranging and truly informative presentation. Thank you very, very much.